Good evening, campus. Good evening. I said good evening, campus. Good evening. I hope you guys are ready to get into the word of God. Yeah. I hope I don't have a bunch of uh, Muslims in the house today. Okay, do I got any disciples in the house? Yeah. We got to save them. We got to love them. We got to encourage them to come into the kingdom. Yeah. And uh, it's an honor to be with you guys. I missed the campus ministry right there. <laughs> missed you guys. And I uh, appreciate a couple of you clapping right there. Uh, but we'll get into the word of God. And uh, perhaps the word of God will motivate your heart to go out and make disciples. We moved here in 2010 and I was told, don't go down to Peckham. Don't go down there. You're going to get in trouble. You're going to die. So I went to Peckham, 12 o'clock midnight, had an awesome Bible study with a Muslim and baptized him. Hey. Romans chapter one. We started going after arguably the scariest areas of London, the atheists at UCL, the Muslims down in South London, and God smashed all those idols. Amen. The Bible says in Romans, I so love Paul, he calls himself a bondservant, and he says this here in verse 16. He says something that I wonder if you believe. He says in verse 16 of Romans chapter one, for I'm not ashamed of the gospel because it is what? The power of God. That brings salvation to everyone who believes. Paul comes to all of those who would be in Europe. And of course, we know that this book here has the word God in it every 46 verses because they needed God. They didn't have the right God, so they needed God. And he came to a place that didn't really believe in God. And every 46 verses, he says God more in this book than any of, a, of his letters. Every 46 verses, he says the word God. Dare we say the Europeans need the word of God. And as he gets down to verse 6, he says, I'm not ashamed. I hope you are not ashamed of the gospel. Because if you are, you're unqualified to be a disciple. The title of the lesson is Islam, the doctrine of deceit. Islam, the doctrine of deceit. The Hadith makes it clear that Muslims are allowed to lie to unbelievers in order to defeat them or to protect themselves. There are several forms of lying that is allowed in Islam. There's taqiyya, saying something that isn't true as it relates to Muslim identity. That's a Shiite term, so it's mostly the Shiites that do that. There's kitman, that's lying by omission, not telling it all. There's taira intentionally creating a false impression. And then there's Maruna. We got a lot, of cover, a lot to cover tonight, so you're gonna have a lot of notes. These are all just some of the lies that are allowed, and any doctrine that allows you to lie is a doctrine of deceit. Wow. One man said a lie gets halfway around the world before the truth has the chance to put its trousers on. That was Winston Churchill. Another man said, lies are like quicksand. The more you try to get out of them, the deeper you sink. And the more you go into Islam, the deeper you sink because they allow their prophets to change the word of God. So you can never nail them. Lies are like broken vases. Once shattered, it's impossible to piece together the original trust. And once we shatter the lie of Islam, nobody should be able or be willing or be wanting to trust the Quran. Colossians chapter one. Colossians chapter one. The book of Acts is the directive. All the letters are corrective measures. In other words, these are the churches that have been started and he has to come and correct them on things. And he says something very powerful in the book of Colossians, something that can be done. In Colossians chapter one, the Bible says this here in verse six. You pick it up in verse five. It says the faith and love that spring from the hope stored up for you in heaven about which you have heard, which you have already heard in the true message of the gospel. That has come to you in the same way the gospel is bearing fruit and growing throughout the entire world. If you flip over to verse 23, it says every creature under heaven has heard the truth. In other words, they evangelize the nations in their generation. The Bible was able to influence the entire known world at that time. Of course, this is written roughly about 56 A.D., but when the world was evangelized, you could argue just simple dates that the world was evangelized by 70 AD. So by 70 AD, the entire world was saturated with the gospel. 
not part of the world, the entire world. They have, it's a, every creature under heaven has heard. Now, to evangelize the world does not mean everybody becomes a Christian. It means everybody hears what it means to become a Christian. How do you become a Christian and how does everyone hear? Through preaching the good news and persecution. Persecution is one of the vehicles to get the news out there. It's one of the ways that the first century disciples were able to get the gospel all around the world. So now we have some great time markers because history repeats itself. It has to. No one listens. So if the world was evangelized by 70 AD, if everybody heard the Bible by 70 AD, you got to help me understand how Islam could come along 600 years later. All the apostolic books were canonized or collected and formulated into what we know as the Holy Bible by 150 AD. That doesn't mean they wrote it in 150 AD. That means we had the Bible by 150 AD. So by 150 AD, Muhammad could have read the Bible. By 150 AD, 500 years before there was ever a thought of, an Isla, uh, of a Muslim, before there was a dream to create another false, to uh, false doctrine, the doctrine of deceit. Islam started in 600 AD. It's almost 500 years after the world was evangelized. That, that's, that's a big deal. The gospel, first of all, has, has eyewitness accounts that lived during the time that Jesus lived. Sadly, Muslim, Muhammad had no eyewitness accounts. Nobody that actually saw him actually, uh, you know, have these revelations. It was all his own thing. First Corinthians chapter 14. First Corinthians chapter 14 says this here. Verse 33, you know this scripture. First, first Corinthians 14, for God is a God of disorder. No, no that means you got to clean your room up. Okay. <laughs> he said, for God is not a God of disorder, but of peace. And the church said, Amen. do we serve a disorderly God? No. Do we serve a confusing God? No. Do we serve a God that would confuse you? No, no he'll convict you, but he won't confuse you. God is not a God of disorder and confusion. If God is not a God of disorder and fusion, and the King James Version says, for God is not the author of confusion. We know who that is. Satan, John chapter eight. Satan is the author of confusion. If God is not the author of confusion, then Satan is. Anything that's confusing is of Satan, according to the word of God. It says God is not a God of confusion, but of peace. God doesn't create confusion. People do. Even you can create confusion in a Muslim because you're too chicken to share your faith with them. I thought that Christianity was the most bold religion. But if you don't have the conviction to say, I am not ashamed of the gospel and preach to them, you can create confusion in their heart and they never, ever become a true disciple or hear. Where's your faith? God does not confuse people. People confuse people. People confuse people. And the author of confusion is Satan. So when Satan confuses people, people confuse other people. Yeah. Are you with me right there? Yeah. God doesn't create multiple paths, multiple gods, multiple words that lead to one place. That is not the God of the Bible. And that is not God. You said, well, why, why wouldn't he create a bunch of different? Because it's confusing. Yeah. It's confusing. All tube lines don't go to the same place. Nope. All planes don't fly to the same destination. Nope. It's confusing to say all these different paths lead to the same place. Mm. And yet you have the individuals that would say, well, you know, all paths lead to the same place. Islam is just another path. They're all fundamentally the same wow. with incremental difference. Yeah. Wrong. Mm. They're fundamentally different and incrementally similar. Yeah. They're fundamentally different. Either Jesus died on a cross or he didn't. Yeah. The Quran teaches he didn't. That's a fundamental difference. God doesn't create multiple paths, multiple gods, multiple words that lead to one place because it creates confusion. And confusion argues against the very nature of God. He's a God of order, not disorder. That's the reason why the second law of thermodynamics teaches that order leads to disorder. Yep. Our God is an orderly God. The God of Allah, the God of the Quran is disorderly. The God of Quran, the Quran teaches that the sun sets in a muddy pond in Surah chapter 18. That's confusing. 
That's very confusing. And there is no, uh, there, there is no, uh, you know, that would just, you know, uh, you know, analogous. There's no, just, that's, that's what it says. It's very confusing, scientifically confusing. Whereas the word of God is very clear. It is said that the Quran was revealed to Muhammad orally by the angel Gabriel or Jibril in a cave. In a cave. Nobody was with him. He went in the cave and all of a sudden angel Gabriel appeared to him. And then Muslims teach that Jesus is not God, not the son of God. They also teach that he didn't die on a cross, but he died in India somewhere, somewhere. Somebody died in his place. That's what they teach. Okay. If that's what they teach, you got to explain to me. Uh, if Gabriel talked to him, then my Bible says this here in Luke chapter one, verse 26. In the sixth month of Elizabeth's pregnancy, God sent the angel Gabriel to Nazareth, a town in Galilee. Galilee. Now you skip down in the verse in verse 37. It says, even Elizabeth, your relative, is going to have a child in her old age. And she who was said to be unable to conceive in her sixth month for no word from God will ever fail. The Bible doesn't fail. Did Gabriel appear to Muhammad or Mary? Come on, bro. This is approximately 2 AD. This before the world was even evangelized. God revealed through an angel, Gabriel, that Jesus would be called the son of God and that Jesus would save the world, not Allah. In John chapter 14, in verse 6, Jesus says himself, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No other path to God besides me. Either that's true or, G or that's a lie. So now we have to deal with what's called the Quranic confusion, which is called a delusion. The Quranic confusion, which is called a delusion. Muslims say this here. They say the completed word of God is the Quran and Islam is God's final re revelation. That God he gave you a little bit with Jesus and everything. But then 600 years later, he had to, you know, he took about five, 600 years to figure out what he wanted to say. And he said it to a guy in a cave by himself. Nobody heard from him. He just went in a cave by himself and God finished what he wanted to say. Okay, so you're telling me that God wasn't completed with his word with the Bible. With the Old and the New Testament, you're telling me that you believe God wasn't completed with what he wanted to, his revealed word to mankind was incomplete with the Old Testament and the New Testament. So the Quran fulfills the word of God. Okay, well, if the completed word of God is the Quran and Islam is God's final revelation, in other words, the Quran contains both Judaism and Christianity, uh, first of all, you gotta, you, gotta, you gotta help me understand Surah chapter five, verse six through eight, which says this, O people of the book. Who are the people of the book? Christians and Jews. So the Quran talks about Christians and Jews. Oh, people of the book. You have nothing to stand on unless you observe the Torah, Old Testament, the gospel, and what has been revealed to you from the Lord. Oh my goodness. The Quran teaches to judge by the gospel of Jesus. The Quran teaches you need to judge by the Old and the New Testament. Hmm. If the Quran says you got to judge by the Old and the New Testament, it says, oh, ye people of the book. Again, it's talking about Christians and Jews. It says you have no law to stand on unless you obey the law of the Gospels, the Bible. So most Muslims believe in the Bible. So if we are to do what the Quran says and go back to the Old and the New Covenant, then if we go back to the old and the new covenant, there's a problem. It leaves no room for another revelation. Wow. Say, well, where'd you get that from? Well, let's go back to, let's do what the Quran told us to do. Didn't the Quran tell us to go to the Bible? So let's, let's do what the Quran, let's do what Muslims, what the Quran told us to do. Let's go to the Bible. In Jude chapter, let's talk to Jesus' brother. Jude chapter one. How do we know there's only one revelation? Well, Jude says this here in verse one, uh, chapter one, verse three is only one chapter in the back of your Bible. Jude one, verse three says he found it necessary to write appealing to you to contend for the faith. He says you can't be a pretender. You got to be a contender. He says to contend for the faith that was once for all delivered to the saints. Right here. The brother of Jesus says there was only one revelation. 
and it was once for all. That means nothing else is coming. There's no other revelations according to the Bible. Hey, you just told me to judge by the Bible. I did. It says there's no other revelations coming. You just told me with your Quran that the Quran points to the Bible. You just told me also that the Quran is the final revelation. Well, how come the Bible says there's, the Bible is the final revelation? Which is it? Is the Quran the final revelation? Or is it the Bible the final revelation? Well, you told me the Quran teaches me to go to the Bible, which says it's the final revelation. So the Quran says to obey the Bible. Since the Quran says obeying the Bible is what the Quran teaches, then the, then the Quran is false. Because the Quran says it makes no mistakes. And the Bible says there's one revelation once for all. It's done. But the Quran teaches that the word of Allah makes no mistakes. But it just told us to judge by the gospel of Jesus. Which is once and for all. But you just told me that the Quran is the final revelation. And then the Quran teaches to judge that there's no, no word of Allah is, is corrupt. And so when I ask you why you don't follow the Bible, you, oh, the Bible's corrupted. Wait a minute. The Quran told me to judge by the Bible. So I'm judging by the Bible. And the Bible says there's once for all. There's only one revelation. But you tell me there's another one. And now I'm going to make another judgment according to the Bible. The Bible says that Satan is the author of confusion, not God. So you're confusing me now. And since the Quran told me to go to the Bible, I'm going to assume that it's not me that's confused, but you, a person under the influence of the author of lies, Satan, the devil. So if the Bible is true, the Quran is false. And if the Quran is telling you to obey a corrupted document, it's still false. If it's telling you to obey a corrupted document, it's still false. If it's telling you to obey something that's wrong, it's still wrong. I'm here to tell you that God predicted that this would happen. I'm here to tell you that God knew that somebody would come along and make up a story. Galatians chapter one. God knew somebody would come on with some fake Air Jordans claiming that they're the real deal. God knew somebody would come along and say, I'm, I'm the king. Without the ring. For those that play basketball, you know what I'm talking about. We love LeBron. He's the ninth best player in the world. He's great. He's great. He's just number nine. Maybe, 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 maybe eight. Maybe, maybe eight. God predicted this. Let's go to Galatians. Not chapter five, verse 19. We normally get. Let's go to chapter one. Okay, Galatians chapter one. Sorry about that. Galatians chapter one. Galatians chapter one. Okay, here we go. Verse six. I'm astonished. I'm astonished. I'm astonished that you're so quickly deserting the one who called you. You know, I pray that as disciples, you're not so quickly deserting. He says, I'm astonished that you're so quickly deserting the one who called you to live uh, the grace of Christ and are turning to a different gospel, which is really the same gospel. Any other gospel against the gospel of Jesus is no other gospel. He says, which is really no gospel at all. Evidently, some people are throwing you into confusion and are trying to pervert the gospel of Christ. But even if we, Paul says, even if I fall away. He says, I'm doing the sermon and if I fall away, I'm teaching you the truth. But if I tank on you guys and I get confused and start sounding confusing and, you know, it's the mess. Don't follow me. See, God doesn't confuse people. People confuse people. So if you're confused, you're confused by people who are under the influence of the author of lies, Satan. I'm not confused. I know that Jesus is the truth. And I follow one gospel. He says, even if we, Paul says, if one of the guys I train falls away and starts teaching a different, softer gospel. Doesn't want to. An, an, an unoffensive gospel. You know, just, you gotta be nice. Don't wanna hurt anyone's feelings. You realize when Jesus started his ministry, the first sermon, Luke chapter four, they took him to a hill to try, as soon as he said they're awesome, they were like, awesome. As soon as he told them they're in sin, he, they tried to throw him off a cliff. Jesus didn't end radical on the cross, he began radical from the beginning. Controversial. You don't wanna be controversial, you don't wanna be like Jesus. And he'll be ashamed of you on judgment day. People die every two seconds. This could be your last day. And if you don't stand strong under the Bible, 
And you're ashamed to lay it on out. God will be ashamed when you go to heaven. He says, if we are an angel from heaven should preach a gospel other than the one we preach to you, let him be what? Challenged? No. Marginally off? No. Making a few errors? No. no. Hot. Heat. Sulfur. Burning. Hell. Eternally cursed. Eternal. Forever. Cursed. That's not good. That's not good. God predicted that some guy would come along and say an angel spoke to him. Islam was predicted in the Bible. Whatever angel pre preached to Muhammad was, a, was, whatever that angel preached, it was a different gospel. An angel told Muhammad, Jesus did not die on the cross and rise again. An angel, that's what he said. Didn't he say an angel? He spoke to an angel in the cave. That's what he said. Well, an angel lied to you. Because even historians that don't believe in the Christian truth believe that Jesus died on a cross. Tertullian, I can go, I got a list of them. And these are people that were Christian. They don't have an axe to grind. They don't have an agenda. They're just stating the facts. That angel told you something that was wrong. Paul says the angel and Muhammad in this case are eternally condemned. You say, well, yeah, but the Bible says with God, all things are possible. That means God can do anything, right? Wrong. God can't do anything. Hebrews chapter six. God can't do anything. There are some things that God can't do. Let's find out what God can't do. People are like, man, I'm, this is some new stuff I'm hearing tonight. I thought God could do anything. No, the God, there's stuff God can't do. Let's find out what God can do. Hebrews chapter six. God did this so that by two unchangeable things in which it is impossible for God to lie. God won't lie. God won't lie. Then how come the Quran is teaching a lie? Because the Quran isn't God. How come the Quran says to judge by the gospel of Jesus? The gospel of Jesus is right. But the Quran claims that Allah is God. But the Bible says God doesn't lie. God doesn't lie. There are certain things that God can't do. And Jesus will not lie. He cannot lie. These things are unchangeable. It's impossible for God to lie. So either uh, Muhammad's lying, uh, his people are lying, somebody's lying. But it's not God. It's not God. Muslims claim that Muhammad was the final prophet. They say Ishmael, later to become the Arabs, uh, is also the seed of, uh, of, of Isaac, okay? Uh, but if you look at Genesis chapter 21 and verse 12, it says, but God said to him, do not be distressed about the boy and, your, and the slave woman. Listen to whatever Sarah tells you because it is through Isaac that your offspring will be reckoned. Isaac, the word Quran means recitation. Recitation, that's what Quran means. Help me understand how Muhammad was illiterate then. If Muhammad is historically, this is, this is not my statements against him. These are what he says. These are what their historians say. He was illiterate. If he's illiterate, then how did, then how, well, how did we get the Quran? How did he recite it? Confusing me again. What is it? Did he recite it or didn't he? He, he recited it. But he was illiterate. How did, how did he recite something he didn't even know how to talk? Did not read. He was illiterate and he recited it. Hmm. Back in the 90s, I'm a 90s guy. There was, a, there was a comedian named Arsenio Hall, and he, would, he had this show called Things That Make You Go, Hmm. I mean, that's one of those things that make you go, Hmm. And it was his way of saying, you're a lion. You would say nowadays, you are capping. Islam is cap. Muhammad said that he passed the Quran by word of mouth. It is said that his companions served as his scribes. And of course, this truth can be found in the Hadith, in the writings about Muhammad uh, and his life. Uh, it is also reported that the Hadith, uh, that few people or few of the scribes uh, had the authority to change his words slightly or dramatically to make utterances more poetical. That means the people that transcribe his illiterate things that somebody said to him in a cave had editorial rights over what the angel said to him. So the angel that spoke to him as an illiterate person, the final revelation was okay to be changed by the scribes because they have editorial rights over what the angel said to him. I think I'm confused again. Is the Quran 
God's word? No, it isn't. It's not the word of God. That's why you're confused. That's why it's confusing. And that's why you can never nail them down because they believe in lying. Even if you look at the history of Islam, there's a treaty called the Treaty of Hudubaya. Islam was started really more of a political construct. And when he tried to get into Medina, when he tried to get into it, would be like it would be like so Northern Ireland going, I'm going I'm going to back into the Brexit. I'm not I'm back in. I'm going to, you know, you get some guys from Northern Ireland. They're going and, and, and then the Europeans are going, listen, we have the whole EU. We can like nuke you in a second. What do you want? We just want to be in. So, OK, you're allowed in. And once Muhammad was allowed in, he recruited people. And he used the freedom and the peace, the Treaty of Hudabaya. He used the peace to gain, gain his following. And instead of being grateful to be allowed in, he created a militia and he sacked the country. And, and it was called the Treaty of, they signed a treaty with him, the Treaty of Hudabaya, but it was, he lied. And so this got introduced as part of Islam. It's okay to lie. Wow. It's okay to lie. Wow. Muslims claim that the Quran was completed, or the Quran is similar to the Bible and is to be added to the Bible as God's completed word. Um, it's very clear, Muhammad himself, uh, he says this, Muhammad himself was instructed to double check his revelation with the Bible. Surah 10, verse 9. When I speak to an individual from this background, I quickly tell them, I can prove from your own teachings that Jesus is your God. Not Allah. Jesus is your God. One of the names of the God of Islam is Al-Haq, Surah 22, verse 6 through 7, which means in Arabic, the truth. But the Bible says in John chapter 14, verse 9, Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Jesus is your God. He is your Al-Haq. Another name for the God of Islam is Al-Baheth. The resurrection. Did Jesus say in the gospel, I am the resurrection? Yes, he did. John eleven twenty five through 26. Jesus says, I am. Not I'm going to be. I am. That's eternity. Now I was created. I am. I am the resurrection. That means I'm not going to be the resurrection. He was the resurrection before he resurrected. That means, that's because God's outside of time, space and matter. I am the resurrection. He was the resurrection before he resurrected. He is your Al-Baheth. Another name for the God of Islam is Al-Awal, the first. We know Jesus is the Alpha. Another name for the God of Islam is Al-Akur, the last. We know Jesus is the Omega. Revelation 22, verse 13. I am the Alpha and the Omega. Another name for the God of Islam is Al-Malak, the King of Kings. We know in Revelation chapter 17, verse 14, Jesus is the King of Kings. Another name for the God of Islam is Al-Hadi, the gate. We know in John chapter 10, verse 9, Jesus says, I am the gate. And anyone who enters through me will be saved. Another name for the God of Islam is Al-Nur, the light. In John chapter 8, verse 12, Jesus, I am the light of the world, and if you're a disciple, you are the light of the world. Yeah. All these verses, clearly, Jesus is your God. Yeah. Muslims say Jesus didn't say he was God, and the Bible never said he was, he was God. The Bible never says that. Let's go with yours now. Let's do you. Let me do it with you guys. You mess up my, my, let's use your, where in your Bibles did Jesus say he's God? Oh, thank you for asking. Uh, Titus chapter two, verse 13. While we wait for the blessed hope, the appearing of the glory of the great God and savior, Jesus Christ. <laughs> Titus two, verse 13 says Jesus is God and savior. You can read that to the Jehovah's witnesses as well. Oh, that's only one time. That's only one time. Oh, no, that's not enough. Okay, 1 John chapter 5. 1 John chapter 5. We know also that the Son of God has come and he has given us understanding. God will give you understanding. So that we may know him who is true. And we are in him who is true by, see, by being in him, the Son, Jesus Christ. He is the true God and eternal life. Dear children, keep yourself from idols like Islam. John told you Jesus is God. A couple more and then I'll show you some information here. 
some things that may help you. I don't know if any of that could have. Muslims say, well, you know, in John chapter 14, Jesus says he is not God. Well, let's look at John chapter 14. Why does Jesus say the father is greater than him? That's what they, they, you'll, you'll hear that. Why does Jesus say he's, God's greater than him? Well, let's look at it. John 14, verse 28. You heard me say I'm going away and I'm coming back to you. If you love me, you would be glad that I'm going to the father. For the father is what? Greater than I. The Greek word is magas. It means greater in position, not power. Greater in position, not power. Why? Because the father was in heaven. He was on earth. Heaven's a greater position, but not necessarily power. He was in a greater place. Jesus was in a lesser place. The word greater can mean someone who's better in essence and position, or it could be somebody who's in greater, or it could be, uh, or it can be greater in uh, a higher officer status. Okay, so God was greater in in, in office because He was in heaven, but He wasn't really he, he wasn't greater in essence and position. Okay, that's like Kobe is greater in essence and position than LeBron. Okay. And our, and our brother Luca told me that, you know, Ronaldo is greater in essence and position over Messi. He told me he's greater in, in, he's greater in essence and position. The greater that Jesus is talking about is greater in office and status. Greater in office and status. Paul Busari is the East region leader, soon to be a super region leader. Kane Taylor is trying to make intern. Are both fully human? Do, yeah. Can you guys? You got to support your brothers here right there, okay? They both are fully human. Are you required to give them? Do, are they, do they get the same dignity? Do they have the same purpose? Do they have the same power? Power. And value in eyes of God. Yeah. Exactly. God doesn't show favoritism. God doesn't show favoritism. Romans chapter 2 verse 11. So when he says greater, he says he's in great in position. He's in heaven. I'm on earth. But Jesus is fully submissive to God, but equal to God. Submission is what equals do. That should be for the sisters. Submission is what equals do. He was fully submissive and fully equal. Let's keep, let's finish this one out. John chapter 14. John chapter 14. Just a couple of things here. Verse 12. How do we know greater? Well, you, you know this scripture. In verse 12, it says, um, very truly, I tell you, whoever believes in me will do the works I've been doing. He will do what? It's the same Greek word. Even greater things. Did they do greater things? Greater in quality? Did they do greater, greater in quality than Jesus? No. Greater in quantity. How many people did Jesus baptize and convert? How many were in his ministry while he was on earth? 120. How many did the disciples? 40 days after, 3,000. got. They did do even greater things in quantity. But nobody could do something greater than Jesus. What are you talking about? You can walk on water? What are you talking about? You can do something greater than that? He wasn't talking about better than him. And he uses the same greater... The word here is the same in John chapter 14. So you tell Muslims that. I hope you guys caught that right there. Uh, I got so much other stuff to say, but I'm not going to say it. Um, okay, look at verse. Okay, let's keep looking at this. Look at verse 13. Look at verse 13. Check this out. And I will do whatever you ask in my name. This is Jesus saying, I will do whatever you ask. In my name. I will do, not the Father, I will do. Whatever you ask, whatever 8 billion people ask, I can hear everybody's prayer at the same time. I know what everybody said at the same time. You gotta be omnipotent, omnipresent to do that. You gotta be God to do that. And it was blasphemy to pray to, to ask someone to pray to you. Jesus is God. Jesus is God. He says, pray to me so that the Father may be glorified in the Son. The Quran teaches that all invocations must be directed to God alone because only God can answer prayers. In order for Christ 
to know who's praying, to know where they're praying, to know what they're praying. You got to be omnipotent, omnipresent. You got to be God. Exactly. Satan is an omnipotent. Omnip- Satan can't be in the same place at the same time. He, or he can't be in several places at the same time. God can. We get confused. We think Satan's God. God can be in L.A. and New York at the same time. Right. Satan can't. Mm. Satan has to ask God to persecute you. According to the Bible, he has to go, man, I got to make it hard for her. She's an entitled Westerner. She's lived in London all of her life. I need to, I need, she needs some persecution. She just wants to be liked all the time. She, put her family against her. Put her best friends against her. See if she's, say, put her, put her family. See if she really loves me. See if she really does love me. Oh, see, yeah, she didn't love me. She thought she it was a social club. She's going to be in hell wishing she would stay a disciple. God allow Satan to test you. My mom, man, my mom came after me. I got baptized. I was going to clubs, nightclubs, sleeping around. My mom said nothing. I got baptized in the kingdom of God. Oh, it's a cult. Uh, Mom, how come you weren't there? I was in Vegas. I almost died in Vegas. I mean, it stopped me from going to that nightclub. But the moment I go to a church and the conviction that I got starts convicting you. And my light starts exposing your darkness. Only light displaces darkness. Now, You've gone too far. Mm. See, the Bible is very clear. Jesus was God. And uh, I'll leave you with a couple of last things here. The Bible predicts that your salvation was promised before the beginning of time. How in the world are you going to have something promised before the beginning of time? The Bible teaches that time had a beginning. Before the beginning of time. First Timothy chapter... Second Timothy chapter one, verse nine says he has saved us and called us to a holy life, not because of anything we have done, but because of his own purpose and grace. This grace was given us in Christ Jesus before the beginning of what? That means God's outside of time, space and matter. He's timeless. He's spaceless. He's matterless. He doesn't need time. You do. He doesn't need to be created. You do. He doesn't need matter. He doesn't need matter. He doesn't need space. He is spirit. God is spirit and his worshipers must worship in spirit and truth. You were created as a spirit. That's put into a dirt body. When the Bible says in Genesis that he says, God created, let us create man in our image. The Greek or the Hebrew word is ish, spirit. He took a spirit and stuck it in a dirt body. That's the reason why Jesus couldn't come to the earth until he had a body. And when Jesus came down as a spirit, he influenced, God came down as a spirit. He was in Jesus' body as a baby. And then he died. All, All bodies need a, all spirits need a body. That's why demons try to get into your body. Okay, now let's look at some history on Islam right there. Good to great, right? We got to go from good to great. Can we go from good to great? Okay, get through the Michael Williamson part. Okay, largest. (laughs) Okay, check it out. Uh, Second largest religion in the world. 1.57, 1.57, uh, this, this, no, for those of you that are, okay, for the persecutors that are watching and you're going to nail me on the exact number, uh, there could be a number off, there could be a few more people, don't, 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 just to the pure, all things are pure. I'm talking to all you persecutors in our former fellowship and the followers. Just see the heart of the message. Okay, now we can get it. Okay, great. 1.57 billion followers, Christianity is 2.1 billion, we got work to do. Amen. Yeah. No, no, go back, go back, go back. <laughs> work to do. Okay, the founder of Muhammad, uh, he lived from 570 to 632 uh, in Mecca. Uh, the major sects of Islam you can see are Shiite and Sunni. Uh, Islam means submission to God. Uh, but, you know, the Quran just confuses us as to who God is. Do we judge by the Bible? Do we judge by the Quran? So we, we, we don't go by the Quran. But that's what Islam means. Muslim means one who lives according to God's will. Is it God's will to be confused? Nope. So as a Muslim, you're telling me to judge by the gospel of Jesus, but then you tell me that the Bible is corrupted. That's the reason why you don't follow it. Because the Bible is, the Quran is the final revelation, but the Bible says there's only one revelation. Oh my goodness. Can't be a Muslim anymore. <laughs> Allah, personal name for God. Keep going. Okay, this is the population by country. You can see 3%, actually in the western part, over here in North America, uh, United States, South America, Brazil, down there. The Lord has protected the Brazilians right there. The Bra- yeah, they, yeah, you guys got other stuff down there. You got other stuff. You got some, you got some stuff down there. Okay. Look where Islam is at. Look at this. Look at that. 
Look at that. Look at Islam. Look at Islam. Okay? Look at where Islam is at. Okay? That's Muslim by population. Okay, look at their territory. Two thirds of the world is uh, two third uh, world Muslim population. Indonesia, 13%. India, 11%. We've got to reach out and make sure Abishak's doing a great job. Pakistan is 11 <laughs> Bro, you got you to do a great job over there for us. Bangladesh has 8%. Nigeria, 5%. Okay. Egypt, 5%. Iran, Turkey, 5%. Algeria, Morocco, only 2%. And then you can see the regional distribution of the Muslim faith. You see that in North America, it's not as high. But then you see, obviously, uh, you can tell Middle, uh, Middle East and North Africa, uh, 317. I'm going to send this slide to the campus so you guys can go through all of it. Uh, I'm going to add some stuff to it so you'll have this and you'll be able to study it on your own and be able to have arguments uh, to really help people understand how Islam is, is uh, making an impact. And this is really for, let me make a segue here. This is really, tonight is really for the Christians. Apologetics doesn't really talk somebody into faith. The way you help someone become a Christian is not by having a, a heated speech that you just heard me give. Okay, that's not how you win them. That took, I, I did that for you. Okay, apologetics helps the Christians. The Bible is very clear how, do you, how you win anybody to Christ. Love. The most excellent way. But it shows you love them when you take enough time to know their religion better than they do. That is the act of love. The act of love is you know their arguments and you know how to refute them. You've taken the time to love them. I can't stand people that persecute me and say the wrong names. Right now, we got persecution against me right now. And they call Michelle uh, Sharia. Uh, she, they, they, like, my wife is the wrong name. Like, I'm like, if you're going to persecute me, at least say the right stuff against me. They name my kids the wrong names and everything. Yeah, I, and one person, yeah, I knew him ever since the Portland days. And he used to work over here. I'm like, I don't even know what company that is anyway. Okay, let's keep going. Muslim territory. 1.8 billion Muslims uh, worldwide. That's a lot of people. Estimated 24% of the world's population. That's 7.5 billion. That was, these are numbers in two, 2017. So we have about 8 billion people in the world now. So the numbers, they say, have gone up. A fifth of the world's Muslim uh, population, more than 3 million, live in countries where Islam is not the, the major religion. That's huge. Where it's not the major religion. Right? And as we talked about in our atheist lesson, one of the issues with the impact of Christianity that we need to talk about a lot. It isn't that uh, people don't know the truth or can't find the truth. One of the issues with Christianity is Christians. Most people, they go, you invite, as soon as you say, yeah, I'd like to invite you. The, they start thinking of the hypocritical Christian. And so we've got to have a great example. You don't need everyone's approval. You don't. You don't need everyone's approval. Be a true disciple. Amen. God is testing you. Just stay faithful. Amen. He'll, you'll, you'll be better. He's making you a diamond. Less than 20% of all Muslims live in the Middle East. 10 to uh, 13 are Shias. 87 to 90% are Sunnis. You should study out the difference between. I don't want to go too long, but study out the difference between the two. Okay. Origins. Islam springs from Judaism. They basically went through Judaism and took stuff. They just took stuff from Judaism and made another religion. Uh, the Bible vaguely predicts the phenomenon that is Islam. Of course, I read the scripture. Muhammad looked to Abraham as one who practiced Islam, submission to God, referring to Ishmael, Genesis chapter 16. But of course, I read the scripture earlier that really kind of refutes that. Born in 570 AD, Mecca, orphan at the age of six. That would, that, that'll put some challenges on you. If you're orphan at the age of six. Raised briefly by his grandfather until he died, then raised by his uncle. At 25, he led caravans of successful businesswomen, including his eventual wife, uh, Khadija. And I don't want to go to the age of the individuals that he married and all of that, but that's, it's, it's, pretty, it's pretty embarrassing. He was so successful, he proposed marriage. Uh, she proposed marriage to him. She was 40 years old, and he was, he was 25 years old. They were married for 15 years after which Khadija died. Then Muhammad started having multiple wives. It's okay to have multiple wives, right? Sisters? Anyone want to say Allah is Lord? You want to hear what's embarrassing? You want to hear what's embarrassing? Last year, a sister that was in this meeting fell away and married a Muslim. 
She probably sat through meetings like this and took no notes. Life of Muhammad. Disillusioned with the world. Withdrew. He was bitter and went to the desert. He was bitter. He eventually sought solitude and rest. I mean, he was disillusioned with the world. I mean, you're orphan. Craziness is going on. He went into the desert, and it was on Mount Hira, 610 AD, that he claimed for the first time to have received a vision from the angel Gabriel at the age of 40. I mean, I feel sorry for him. All right, bro, you out there. You, you, you openly say you had no friends. You're in the desert by yourself. I mean, that's rough, man. It's hard for a Muslim out here in these, in these streets. You know what I mean? He's out there. He's over there. He's just like, man. And then he gets this. I mean, come on, man. The angel reportedly told Muhammad that he was to be God's messenger. He returned. I know a lot of people that think they saw God. They're in the NHS. I know a lot of people. Okay. They have mental. Pro I'm not being funny, but I'm being, they have mental problems. Okay. And so there's another argument for him. Uh, that I didn't go into and write, but there are writers that say that he did have mental issues. Uh, he returned to Mecca and he began preaching in 622 AD after his uncle and aunt died. He was expelled from Mecca and traveled to Medina. Okay, uh, the journey uh, or the Hijra marks the beginning of the Islamic era as well as their calendar. Uh, the Jews of Medina did not support him uh, as God's prophet as expected, so he drove two clans out and eventually executed another. Uh, it's a religion that's based, there's a lot of violence in it, okay? Uh, religion began to take shape, five pillars originated, many successful uh, conversions in Medina. That's what I remember I told you earlier about him going into Medina and then them signing the Treaty of Hudabaya, you're gonna, we're gonna allow you into the country, just don't do anything crazy. Wow. He recruits a whole militia and starts Islam and overthrows the city and introduces uh, lying as something that's okay. He began armed raids on Mecca and in 630 AD conquered uh, this pivotal city. So Islam started as a political construct to overthrow cities, not a religion. Not a religion. Now let me take a segue here. I think hip hop is on the way to becoming a religion. It's arguably one of the most wicked and evil things I've ever heard in my life. The music is godless and an embarrassment to anyone who's a musician. And that's the reason why we gotta make a lot of music. And people, people say, yes, yeah, about the culture. No, it's not about the, about the Bible. You're talking about the culture. What are you talking about? It's not about black or white, it's about right or wrong. Are you with me right here? Yeah. So we gotta be mindful of that. Hip hop has taken the world by storm. And in the same way that it started as a musical thing of people on the underground that had a struggle and wanted to do something. I mean, this is, this is Islam. And now it's, I mean, and now it's a religion and people are worshiping it. Okay, let's keep going. Allah was worshipped alongside many other pagan uh, gods in Mecca. Uh, in uh, Mecca at black meteorite known as Kaaba. Okay, when Muhammad finally conquered Mecca, uh, he cleared the Kaaba of its pagan symbols and then many people converted. Uh, the point, Muhammad raised Allah to be the chief god and eventually the only god. In 632 AD, he declared that he had left the people the book of Allah, the Quran, and then he dies at 63. Basic beliefs. It's, this is convicting. Youngest of the world's major religions. They don't view it as, new, as a new religion, but rather the same original faith as taught by Abraham and everything. But it is actually the youngest of the major religions. Because as we said earlier, it didn't start for 600 years after the world was evangelized. I mean, the world was evangelized. I mean, the Moravian movement started when they went against the Bible and they said that God is not just the God to be feared. He's a God to be loved. I mean, so much happened in the world. Tons happened. Study out the time between the world being evangelized and it's, there's a ton of stuff. And then this guy comes out of the cave. Nobody's been in there with him and lonely and no friends. And I saw Angel Gabriel. And, here, and you know, so there you go. Uh, it is monotheistic. That's kind of cool. One God. Uh, complete. <laughs> I guess we can take that from it. It believes in a chain of prophets starting with Adam and including Noah, so on and so forth. Muslims regard uh, the divinity concept of Jesus as blasphemous, and they don't believe that he was executed on a cross. They only believe he was a prophet. But we just read your Quran, and you told us to judge by the gospel of Jesus, and the gospel of Jesus says he's God. 
And then the Quran says there's nothing corrupt in the Quran. Keep going. Okay, uh, two sacred texts, the Quran, words of Allah, the Hadith, the collection of Muhammad's sayings. Satan drives people in sin and all unbelievers and sinners will, separ uh, will spend eternity in hell. Muslims who sincerely repent and submit to God will return to a state of sinlessness. Isn't that awesome? And go to paradise after you die. As a Muslim, you can have no sin. You can be sinless. Yeah, that's a sin to say that. Isn't that crazy? When we first planted the church, I, 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 I started getting hit with this a lot because I was going after a lot of the Muslims. And I said, I started with the sin list. I said, let's do a sin list. And the guy looked me right now. He goes, I don't sin anymore. <laughs> so that, I go, that's a sin. That's called a lie. You do sin. Okay, but anyway, that's what they believe. Satan drives people in sin. And so Muslims uh, who sincerely repent and submit to God will return to a state of sinlessness. Yeah, they believe that. Uh, strong sense of morality, alcohol, drugs, gambling, uh, racism should be avoided, so on and so forth. So there's some things about it. Keep going. Uh, Dr. Tawheed, the great truth of God's uh, oneness in Islam. There is no God but one. And we know who that is, Jesus Christ. Key beliefs. Oh, no, we can keep going. Okay. No, no, go back. Okay. Look. Perfect. A little confusion while we're doing the Muslim talk. It's consistent. Okay. This breaks my heart, actually. Because I know more Muslims that are more sincere and radical than people that call themselves disciples. They pray more. I'm not just saying that for, I went to, I went to Dubai, I, I preached in a Muslim country. And I was like, why does it feel more spiritual in a Muslim country than in London? Wow. Why in the world is, like, it's clean, I don't sell cigarette smoke, I haven't been bumped by a little old lady. Uh, <laughs> respectful, I'm like, wow. And all these people are not going to make it. Wow. Are you grateful that you're a disciple? And that you're not amongst these individuals that sincerely think that they're worshiping? I mean, crazy. The five pillars of Islam. Okay. Uh, Shahada, uh, Salat, uh, Psalm, Haji, and Zakat. You'll get all of these in the slides. Okay. Go back one, go back one more time. I mean, children. You know what I mean? Women, if you go through what the Quran teaches, you know what the Quran teaches? Women are less than men. You're not equal to men. Isn't that sad? And people believe this. We have more than one billion people believe you're not equal as a woman, as a sister. And men who, I mean, it's, we got work to do. Okay, yeah, that's a good documentary. Documentary of uh, one's Muslim pilgrimage. The Haji pilgrimage to Mecca, five pillars of Islam. Uh, two million Muslims make a pilgrimage each year. That's their GLC. <laughs> they pray towards Kaaba. I mean, it's just, it's just, the more I'm putting this stuff together, I'm just like, golly, this is just, I, get, I actually got, it's good for my heart. You know, it's like, wow, look at people are, like, I got, I got, I felt, Sorry. I was like, I got to get on it. We got to start sharing our faith. Okay. The Quran, highly venerated by the Muslims, only touched and read, at, and only read after ceremonial cleansing, never held below the waist. I mean, you got to hold that. I mean, is that how you treat your Bible? Do you even have a Bible? You got Christians that are too afraid to, too lazy to get a Bible. You know what I mean? I'm not saying that's you. I'm not saying that's you, but I'm just, I'm just throwing that out there. You know, it's kind of cool to have a Bible. Or, you know, use a Bible. It's good to use a Bible. Um, let's go. Okay, the Quran is a book of guidance. Quran is a guide, rules to live by. Uh, this life is a preparation for eternal life afterwards. 
It is the utmost importance that the believers be and remain on the straight path and in the end be saved. In the end, that's the part I want to highlight. It, and in the end, be saved from eternal wrath of God and receive into God's blessing in heaven. As, an, as a Muslim, you don't know when you're saved. Okay, if you're a sold out disciple and something crazy happened and we all died, we wouldn't die. We just trade places. True Christians don't die. We just, I just told you, you're a spirit, right? The Bible says it. We don't die. We just trade places. Does that make sense? Yeah. That means you're saved now. You're not going to be saved. Wow. You're saved right this second. Oh, you are a saved disciple right now. <laughs> right now, you would go straight to heaven. <laughs> don't let anyone talk to you about soul sleep and all that stuff. There's a purgatory. No, you go straight to heaven. Does that make sense? Yep. That's a principle out there, soul sleep. I've even had to help disciples with that. Yeah, I think we just soul sleep and then we go to heaven. No, what are you talking about? You go to heaven or hell right away. Right away. Okay? As a Muslim, you don't know whether you got to, you got to, you got to. Okay, here's the difference. Let me, let me make it even more layman's. This is Christianity. This is an analogy of Christianity. You walk into Oxford and they hand you a PhD. Day one, fresher. Here's your PhD. And after they give you your PhD, they show you all the courses you got to go through. Okay? But you got the PhD. Just go through the courses. You've got salvation. It's yours to lose if you forfeit it. Islam is the exact opposite. You got to go all these courses and, and then you'll be saved. Maybe. <laughs> Christianity says even if you don't do the classes and pass, you still got the degree up front. Thank you, Jesus. It's called mercy. Okay. Uh, arguments for the Quran. It's unique literary style. Did you like the unique literary style? Some things I pointed out tonight. That's pretty unique to say to judge by another book and to say your book is unflawed, but the other book says there's no other revelation. That's a unique way to. But this is one of their arguments that, you know, the miracle of the Quran. It is a miracle how something can be corrupted and not corrupted. That is a miracle. Yeah. Muhammad was illiterate. Uh, they argue about its perfect preservation. I'm so happy that you believe the Quran was perfectly preserved because it teaches lies. So it isn't a mistake, and they try to say this, it is not a mistake when it says, judged by the gospel of Jesus. Yeah. It was perfectly preserved. Yeah. Come on. Perfect. Right. Perfect. So you meant, so everything he said he meant. Okay. Uh, it talks, they, one of their strengths is the unity of the Quran. Yeah. <laughs> Scientific accuracy, like the sun setting in a muddy pond. We got anybody scientific tonight? I may, they may find some problems with that. Um, this is the last two I'm going to share. There's more slides. The last two I'm going to share. Contracting doctrines, the status of women. I think you just got to, I mean, in Islam, there are what are called honor killings. Honor killings. In 2009, Islamabad, Afghanistan, three teenagers, three teenage girls were buried alive for the crime of planning to choose their own husbands. And you're struggling with going on a date. Right. Two older women, a mother and an aunt, were shot to death while pleading desperately for their girls to lives to be spared. The executioners were the girl's fathers, brothers, and uncles. Just let that sit. Can you imagine a father killing his daughter? I mean, I have a daughter, man. I got two daughters. 
honor killings. Now, we know that in Christianity, we don't have honor killings. But we know Satan, the author of lies, will even try to persuade those who love us the most to spiritually kill us. And that's the reason why we have to have our faith anchored to the word of God and let Satan get done trying to use them to influence us. And then what happens is when you resist the devil, he flees. So when the devil tries to use your friends, your family, your mates, your classmates to stop you from being a Christian, all you got to do is resist them. And then after a while, Satan goes, dang, they're going to resist. And then Satan leaves. But if you if you let them influence you, then you could get taken out and it could be. So we know that this happens in a spiritual sense. But nowhere in the Bible is it okay for a dad to murder his kid, for a brother, for uncles to do honor killings. How much is this taught in sixth form when you go over Islam? How many times do they teach you about honor killings? How many YouTube videos on this? Oh, I bet they teach you that the Christian crusades, they'll, they'll make sure to teach you that in a heartbeat. But we don't even want to go there because when you look at what atheism has done to the world, athe atheists haven't started any, they didn't start uh, Cambridge and Oxford, and the list goes on, but, but they believe in honor killings. Okay? The Quran states in Surah 4, verse 31, men have the authority over women because God has made the one God has made the one superior to the other. And because they spend their wealth to maintain them. So good women are obedient, guarding the unseen parts because God has guarded them. As for those whom you fear disobedience, admonish them and banish them to the bed uh, to beds apart and to beat them. That's Surah 4, verse 31. Can you read me a scripture that says that we're supposed to beat women? That's what I thought. Christianity, we, be Christianity, we believe in honor saving, Amen. not honor killing, <laughs> honor saving. In 30 AD, early in the morning, a group of Pharisees approached Jesus with a woman caught in adultery. They say that the law commands such a woman to be stoned to death. Jesus says, whoever is without sin, cast the first stone. Risking his own life, Jesus saves the woman and tells her to leave your life of sin. John 8, verse 2 through 11. And we'll, we'll, yeah, we'll leave it there. Um, when Jesus came into the world, there were 60 million slaves. Women were not allowed to, you were not counted on the Roman census. You literally, when they did a census, women didn't count. You literally didn't count. Okay, you could be beaten. You could be injured. A lot of things could have happened to you when Jesus came into the world. So it was Jesus Christ who elevated women. He elevated women. <laughs> Jesus is the true liberator of women. And my mother in the faith wrote a book about it. It's called Elevate. On, yeah. So I want to encourage you, if you're a sister, to read Elevate again this year. I know we read it. Read it again. Read it again. Jesus elevates you. You don't need TikTok to elevate you. None of that. Jesus elevates you. Right? And we got to take care of our sisters. Right, brothers? Yes. And we got to save more brothers and sisters. Yes. I love you. God bless you. Have a great night. <laughs> Thank you.